There's a knife in my pocket, I told Monroe. Maybe it was stupid to allow a random man access to my weapon, but he had saved my life from that creepy seamstress, and I definitely needed help. There was no way I could get the threads out all by myself. He stepped closer and retrieved the knife, thankfully without touching me any more than absolutely necessary. I'll cut it. Just stay still, yeah? He told me as soon as he nodded, he brought the blade to my arms and carefully cut the threads. When I was finally free again, I slowly pulled the loose threads from the wounds and let them fall into the floor. I was bleeding, but it wasn't as bad as I expected. It stung a little, nothing more. Monroe handed me the knife when I was finished. I put it away again and went to pick up my own gun from the floor. Having my weapons back made me feel a little safer. I wouldn't even be surprised if the seamstress stood up again. What was this? I asked and gestured towards the dead woman. Nothing human for sure, Monroe shrugged. I'd say let's stick to zombie rules, hmm? Shoot through the head and burn the bodies. The dead woman had stopped bleeding. I nodded. Burning sounds good. I agreed and began to search the kitchen for a lighter. Already, the second drawer contained a box of matches and I turned around with a victorious smile, but Moreau had already held a lighter and a can of pure alcohol in his hands. Well, having a source for fire couldn't hurt. I put the tinderbox away and watched Monroe pour the alcohol over the corpse. We should get out of here quick, he said. Saving your life would be a little useless if we burnt here. Um, <laughs> yeah, right, thank you for that. No problem, he lit his lighter. Come on, let's go. He lit the trail of liquid on the table and before I even realized, a bright flame traveled towards the body and it went up in flames. Monroe grabbed my hand and pulled me out of the kitchen while our surroundings caught on fire. We stumbled through the open front door until we were on the road again. I looked up. The moon still hadn't moved. Monroe grinned at me. Barely know you for ten minutes and we already committed arson. I think that's the beginning of a great friendship, Kay. But I wasn't going to take any chances this time. I grabbed him by his shirt and held the gun to his head. If you think I trust you, I hissed, you are very wrong. Hey, hey, calm down. He raised his hands defensively. I could have killed you a couple of times in there, but I didn't, right? I saved you. Yeah? Well, that bitch in there seemed really nice too before she sewed my fucking arms together, I replied, pressing the cold metal of the gun harder against his forehead. So, I have questions and if you don't want a bunch of bullets in your brain, you better answer them. Got that? I wasn't sure if it was clever to threaten a potential ally like that, but in all honesty, I was scared. This town was cursed. My arms had just been sewn together, and I didn't want a similar situation to happen with Monroe. I was grateful that he had saved me, but for all I knew, the man could still be some sort of monster. At the moment, I had the upper hand, and I had to use that as long as I could. All right, Monroe agreed. Ask your questions. I just don't know if I can help. How did you find me in there? I pointed at the burning building. Heard you screaming. You sounded human, so I thought I'd check, he answered. Right in time, I guess. I nodded slowly. Not that absurd of an explanation. All right. I don't remember anything, I told him honestly. Just explain this shit here to me, okay? Where are we? You lost your memories? I shoved the gun against his skin again. Answer the question. Hey, Kay, calm down. I lost my memories too, he told me slightly unnerved. How much do you remember? My name? I slowly put the gun down. I woke up in the forest. Everything before that is blurry. All I know is that I came here with my wife, Dia. I have to find her. Now wasn't that great? I had thought I finally had a lead, but it turned out to be a dead end. This town was weird, 
and I really, really despised it. Similar case with me, except the wife, of course. He replied with a weak smile. Dia, you say? Yeah. Have you seen her? About my age. Long, blonde hair. Really beautiful. He hesitated for a moment. No, sorry. You're the first sane person I met around here. It felt horrible to get my hopes crushed over and over again. I was grasping at every little thread only to have them crumble at the slightest touch. Dia was out of reach. I knew she was somewhere near and still had no idea how to find her. My head hurt again. We should stick together, Monroe said. As far as we know, we're the only sane people around here. Except Dia. I refused to believe she had died. She was all right. I would find her. I would take her home. Except your wife, he agreed. You know what? We'll find her and get out of here. How does that sound? Too good to be true. I crossed my arms. So, are you in? He asked, holding his hand out. We should give it a try, at least. I mean, we handled the psycho seamstress, didn't we? My arm still stung from the stitches. I thought handled was an overstatement considering how we had managed to kill her, but the end result was all the same. We had won against something inhuman. We had survived in this nightmare up to this point, and in all honesty, I knew he was right. Staying together would be safer. I grabbed his hand. Fine. We're partners. For now. He smiled. Arsonist buddies it is. I'm sure that'll be fun. I wish I had your fucking optimism, I replied sarcastically and rolled my eyes. I looked back to the house we had left and saw the remaining flames glow dimly through the windows. I would definitely need therapy when this was over. So, any idea where to go? I asked my new partner. It wasn't like I trusted him. The gun was in my hand, the knife within reach. I wouldn't let my guard down around him any more than necessary. If he truly was on my side, great. I could need an ally. And if he wasn't, well, I wouldn't hesitate this time. Down the road, he shrugged. We'll see where that leads us. I rolled my eyes. Amazing, I muttered, but followed him regardless. We walked down the silent road and somehow his presence was comforting to me. My distrust aside, he was a living, breathing human, and not being all alone in this cursed place was definitely reassuring. You think we're the only ones? I asked him, just to break the deafening silence. We walked side by side. I stayed maybe half a step behind him so he couldn't possibly attack me from behind. Just in case. Well, you're the first person I found here after a while, I guess. Hard to tell how long with that never-ending night. He pointed up to the unmoving moon. I don't think there's anyone else. Not human, at least. I sighed. I wish I knew how he got here, and why us. I mean, the sentence was left unfinished because, to be honest, I didn't even know what I meant. Not enough to express it, at least. Why was I here, and why Monroe and Dia... How did the three of us end up here? I don't care much about the why, he answered, as long as we get out of this shit show. I stared at him and tried to remember something, but my foggy brain didn't show me anything. He looked entirely unfamiliar. You think we came here together? I asked anyways. Maybe my memory was deceiving me. Would explain some things, hmm? Yeah. He shrugged again. We'll find out when we're back in the real world. I didn't trust him in the slightest. He may have saved my life, but he was way too calm in a situation like this and too disinterested in finding out what was going on. Of course, I could only talk for myself, but I desperately wanted to figure all of this out. I wanted to remember. More than anything else, I wanted my damn memories back. So how could he care so little? We walked in silence for a while. 
I barely took my eyes off of him and held the gun tightly in my hand. As I noticed movement from my peripheral, I jumped a little and almost raised my weapon. But it was just the gray man, the one who had led me to the empty apartment. He stood on the side of the road, unmoving. His colorless eyes were fixed into Monroe. Okay, Monroe, who had noticed my little jump, asked, You alright? He didn't see the gray man. I wasn't sure what that meant that the ghost was only visible for me, if it was a good sign, or a very bad one. Yeah, it's nothing. I'm... I'm fine, I quickly reassured him. If the gray man didn't want to show himself to Monroe, I certainly wouldn't mention him. We continued our walk and I gave the gray man a questioning look as we passed him, but he did not at all react. His eyes just followed Monroe. I didn't turn around to see whether the ghost had disappeared after we passed him. My attention was focused on Monroe, who I expected to turn on me any second. He was only human, I reminded myself. This wasn't some monster like the seamstress. He was merely a man, and bullets could kill a man. And yet, nothing happened for quite some time. It was hard to say for how long since neither the position of the moon nor surroundings changed. The seamstress told me something, you know? I said at some point as I couldn't stand the silence anymore. Some fairy tale about a girl and a dreamer. He didn't even bother to look at me. So. So. I thought I could figure out what the hell is going on here and this little story could help. Why do you care so much, he replied. For real, Kay, I don't give a shit about what this place is, and especially not about the insane rambling of some monster. I felt anger burning in my chest, bright and hot enough to almost suffocate me. My first instinct was to lash out at him and hurt him somehow, just to get the anger out. To ask him how he expected me to stay calm, almost indifferent in a situation like this. I shoved the thoughts away. I woke up in a forest, I told him instead, as calmly as I could manage, without memory and burning with fever. Excuse me that I want to know how I got in a situation like that. A forest? He finally looked at me. Yes. What's so interesting about that? He didn't answer right away, and I found myself grow tense under his tired gaze. Nothing, he then said. It's just a weird place to wake up. Maybe, just maybe I was paranoid, but at that point I was sure he was hiding something from me. My mind was racing. I was trying to figure out what to do now. He knew something. Whatever that was. I tried to think of something to say. Some clever response, some question that can make him give away some details. But then I saw the gray man, pointing at another door. After miles and miles of identical houses, there was finally something different. The house the gray man pointed at was slightly smaller than the others had been and the color was off. I stared and wondered if I really should follow the gray man's lead once again. Last time, he led me to the seamstress. Who knew where this door would lead? I was scared and definitely not interested in meeting another monster. And yet, this was the only clue I got. I wouldn't find Dia by walking down a never-changing road for all eternity. It's different, I told Monroe, pointing towards the house just like the gray man. I'll go in. Just wait here, and if I'm not back in, I don't know, 15 minutes, come and look for me. All right. Be careful in there, Kay, he agreed almost immediately. I actually felt like vomiting at that response. He had absolutely no way to tell how much time would pass. We both knew that. I nodded and turned around, glancing over my shoulder again and again, because I was afraid he would kill me as soon as I turned my back on him. I looked at the gray man, but he did not react. As soon as I pushed the door open, he vanished again. I stepped inside a large empty room and the door fell shut behind me. A naked light bulb illuminated my surroundings. 
The floor was made of off-white tiles and the walls were bare and white. There were only two things in the entire room. A wooden chair and a hanged man. I couldn't even see what the rope was attached to. The ceiling was too high up and hidden in the shadows. The fraying rope seemed to appear from nowhere and wrapped around the neck of the middle-aged man. He wore a black suit, had long blonde hair, and was definitely dead. It was the third corpse I saw here, and it was still horrifying. I pointed the gun at it just in case and approached it slowly. The gray man had led me here. There had to be a reason. Did I know the dead man? Was he someone from my past? Unlikely, but not impossible. I got closer to get a better look at his face. Maybe it would trigger any memories. He hung in the center of the room and it seemed to stretch endlessly. For a moment, I wondered if I was walking on the same spot because I didn't seem to make any progress towards the body. But when I turned around, the door was already far away. This place was weird. I prayed that Dia was alright, wherever she was. Suddenly, the corpse head jerked up. It looked straight at me, eyes pale and rigid like those of a dead fish. I stumbled backwards. It opened its mouth and a black beetle crawled out of it. I raised the gun. My finger was on the trigger. I didn't move. What do you want? The dead man asked without moving his mouth. I'm looking for my wife. My hands were trembling slightly. The gray man had wanted me to go there. Maybe this hanged man would help somehow. I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure about anything. But Dia was lost, and I was grasping at every straw I could find, even if it meant I had to follow a ghost and talk to a corpse. The gray man had shown me the weapon. He had been on my side. I don't know your wife, the hanged man answered. More beetles crawled out of his open mouth and scattered all over the body. Of course he didn't. Do you know the fairy tale of the girl and the dreamer? I asked instead. I still felt like the story had some sort of significance and I would follow every little trace that could lead me to Dia, however unlikely it was. Even if it would only help me to understand this place a little better, it was at least a start. I do. What happens after she tried to wake up? After the nightmares turn to violent? She tries to wake up, but she can't, the dead man spoke. Her friend, the dreamer, tells her to find the wizard in his castle behind the woods, for he can help her. So the girl travels through the deep dark woods, and she barely escapes death. Vile beasts hunt her through the forest, but she manages to outrun each of them. Some of the beetles crawled over to me and began to climb up my body. I slapped them away. She finds a cemetery and the vengeful spirits try to pull her to her grave, but she escapes them and leaves the forest behind. As the castle of the wizard lies in front of her, she hopes for the dreamer's promise to come true. She is sure the nightmare will end. A beetle reached my face. I slapped it off again. I noticed a movement right behind the hanged man. The gray man had appeared again, face expressionless as always, and he pointed at something behind me. The hanged man had fallen silent. I spun around and faced Monroe who pointed a gun at me. Everything happened very quick after that. I remember pulling the trigger at least twice, the gunshots echoing from the bare wall so loud it was deafening, blood splattering everywhere and a sudden sharp pain ran through my skull. The next thing I knew was the cold floor against my skin and an agonizing headache. I felt lightning strike in my brain, painfully bright light flashed behind my closed eyes. Everything was too hot, too cold, too much. I was hyper aware of the torn clothes touching my skin, of the cold tiles under me. Every fiber of my body screamed in terror as I realized I had been shot. I don't know how long I lay there, trying to piece a coherent thought together. 
My mind was flashing, breaking, burning. All I could think was that I should be dead already, that a bullet had pierced right through my head and it shouldn't take that long for me to die. I opened my eyes and everything was too bright. The colors burnt my vision and I wanted to scream, but not a single noise left my mouth for I couldn't open it. A beetle crawled over my face again. Its tiny legs felt way too heavy. After what felt like seconds and days at the same time, a soothing darkness took over and I was sure it was over by now. I was dead. The shadows eased the pain and swallowed the bright lights in my head. The lightning strikes finally ceased and I was able to breathe again. Had I held my breath? I couldn't remember. When I opened my eyes, I was still alive. I stayed down at first, still dizzy after what had happened, and looked at my surroundings. Monroe, the damn traitor, was gone. A pool of blood on the floor was the only indication that he had been there. The hanged man was lifeless now, his head hanging low and his eyes closed. Black beetles were scattered all around me, some climbing around on my body. The gray man was gone. The bullet must have missed, I thought. Yet I slowly raised my hand to my forehead and it came away bloody. I turned around and found a puddle of blood behind me where my head had lain, as well as a bullet. Jack Monroe had shot me in the head. I was still alive. I stumbled onto my feet and hastily brushed the insects off my body. I should be dead. By all accounts, I should not be alive, and yet, here I stood. A bullet through my brain had left me with nothing but a bloody face and a slight headache. I didn't understand, there was not a single explanation I could come up with. I wanted to go home with my wife. This was insanity. Monroe was gone and I was worried where he was, afraid that he could attack me again at any moment. And yet, what could he do? I had survived a deadly gunshot. Maybe he had no option to kill me, for whatever reason. Was he a ghost too? Could he not interact with a living person like that? Could he not harm them? What if that was the case? Why had I bled? I felt sick. The hanged man stayed motionless and I figured there was no use staying in this room. I desperately wanted to understand what all that meant, but that had to wait. First I had to find Dia and get out of here. Everything else had to be a problem for another day. I picked the gun off the floor, checked that the knife and the tinderbox were still where they were supposed to be, and walked towards the door. The room didn't stretch this time. As I stepped outside, the gray man was waiting for me by the side of the street. No sign of Monroe anywhere. I walked up to the ghost, who didn't react at all except his bland stare I had already become familiar with. You're trying to help me, right? You showed me the weapon and the clues. You tried to warn me about Monroe, I said with a weak smile. My head was still pounding. He just stared at me. Thank you, I said to him as sincerely as I could manage. He stared. The fairy tale is more than just a story, isn't it? That's why you want me to hear it. He stared. I sighed. This wasn't going anywhere. I'll follow it. Which direction is the wizard's castle? I can't remember how to get to the woods. And finally, he lifted his hand and pointed in the direction where the woods were already visible in the distance. I nodded, made the first steps down the road, and turned around again. Do you know why I didn't die? I asked. He stared. Of course, I nodded again. Still, thank you. He faded out of sight and I turned away to continue my way down the road. The woods grew closer quickly and therefore, I knew I was on the right way. I had yet to find out how the story of the girl and the dreamer ended, but I was optimistic. Fairy tales and happy endings, 
the children kill the evil witch and return to their parents. I was going to find whoever was waiting for me beyond the woods. I was going to find Dia. We would return home. I'd get my memories back and everything would be alright. I wouldn't need to think about this horrific place ever again. I wouldn't need to think about my death again. Thinking about how I had survived was useless. I'd asked the wizard about it as soon as I met him. For now, I had to focus on getting through the woods. Everything would be fine after that. It had to be. I was going to find Dia. That's what I told myself as the road ended and the trees surrounded me. I would see another sunrise. Everything would be okay.